The United States adds eight countries to the list of the world's worst human traffickers. How Morocco is coping with a drop in tourism revenue during Ramadan. And in our Music Makers segment, a roundup of Africa 54's top five African music videos. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gido Ewart. This is Africa 54. Vincent Macori is off today. The United States has added eight more countries to its black list of nations most involved in the human trafficking industry. In a report unveiled Thursday at the U.S. State Department, Burma, Haiti, Djibouti, Papua New Guinea, Sudan and Suriname, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan make up the list of the 27 world's worst offenders. VOA's Latsa Hoke has more. Human trafficking is a $150 billion global industry that turns vulnerable people into modern-day slaves, 20 million of them at any given time, said U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. All 20 million are people, just like everybody here. They have names. They have or had families in many cases. And they are enforced to endure a hell, a living hell in modern times that no human being should ever have to experience. The victims are forced to work as sex slaves, industrial and domestic laborers, soldiers or criminals without compensation or hope to get free. They often live in squalor without adequate food or medical care. We all know the sad litany. Girls compelled into sex slavery. Women sleeping in closets, let out only to cook, wash clothes, and scrub floors. Men and boys forced to forego sleep and, to, and sustenance so that they can work around the clock, often in blistering heat or otherwise appalling conditions. In war-torn regions, children are kidnapped to be trained as fighters for various factions. Some people become slaves voluntarily because they do not see any other choice. Impoverished youths often are lured into slavery by promises of employment and prosperity in another country, like the United States. The nation as a whole recovered 153 uh, juveniles throughout the United States. But authorities in many other countries are turning a blind eye to the crime. And in some cases, the trafficking is sponsored by the state. The government in Burma continues to coerce minorities into forced labor, and children are recruited into the state armed forces. Uzbekistan is notorious for forcing adults to work in the cotton fields. The United States holds governments responsible for failing to prosecute traffickers. Slaritsa Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Citing threats posed by the Somali terrorist group Al-Shabaab, the U.S. Department of State has issued a travel warning to Kenya. The statement issued late Thursday warns U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to the border areas of Kenya. It further warned American citizens to avoid traveling to northeastern Kenyan counties of Mandera, Wajir, and Garissa, and the coastal counties of Tana River, Lamu, and Nairobi neighborhood of Islin. In Mombasa, the U.S. Embassy recommends U.S. citizens to visit Old Town only during daylight hours and avoid using the Likoni ferry due to safety concerns. Kenya largely depends on tourism as a foreign exchange earner, and the travel warning is likely to impact the tourism industry. Now, for more perspective on the travel warning, retired Captain Simiu Warunga joins us on the phone from Nairobi. Captain Warunga, what's the general reaction in Kenya to this latest warning from the U.S. State Department? I think from uh, the Kenyan population, there's nothing much uh, people are talking about because I think Kenyans are getting used to these travel advisories. But I think from, the, from a government perspective, because of the resurgent tourism activities and the likelihood that this advisory may impact again on the recovery of the industry, the government seems to be a bit worried and concerned about this advisory. But generally, uh, there's nothing much Kenyans are talking about this advisory. Uh, in a specific reaction from the government in terms of tighter security at the airports and other entry points of the country? Yes, because one of the reasons why, although the government is not talking, one of the reasons why we've seen a, a, a leadership change 
especially at the authority that is in charge of uh, Kenya airports, is because there was a general concern that uh, initially things are not being run well. And uh, one of the reasons why Kenya has not been successful to have direct flights to the U.S. is because of the safety standards of our airports. So, yes, the country and the government is putting a lot of efforts to ensure that what diminishes our status as a secure and as a safe country are dealt with. But generally on this specific advisory, I think the government is learning to take them in stride and do what they need to do and what is expected of them as a government. Now, as we mentioned, Kenya's tourism industry was just picking up. And how does this a lot affect the industry? It does, because the biggest problem is uh, tourists do not necessarily depend on what the destination country says about their safety. And the fact that they rely on their government to advise them on what is expected at their destination. As a country, I think we are concerned that uh, when we are just seeing a resurgence in tourism in this country, then one year down the line, the U.S. government is uh, issuing another advisory. But uh, on the same note, we realize that the government has put in a lot of money to ensure that the security sector uh, takes charge of our tourism, improve on what has been uh, spoken about as the low areas in terms of safety for visitors and animals. And this has now been two years continuously. So I think there's a serious uh, improvement in terms of what the government is doing to assure tourists and visitors to this country that something is being done. And lastly, on the same, we know the British government and the U.S. government are working very closely with the Kenyan government to ensure that tourist destinations and the visitors uh, are kept in, in, in tandem of what the government is doing in assuring them and ensuring them that safety and security of the country has tremendously improved. So, particularly in Mombasa, or some of the counties that have been mentioned, and we know that a lot of tourists go there. Do you think the government, of, the local government in Mombasa, is taking any measures at this point? Yes, and uh, I need to be very clear on this. Uh, of course, the, the county government of Tana River has not done much in terms of security because we don't hear much about that. But in terms of Kaka, uh, uh, Mombasa and Kwale and Kilifi, we know the county okay. governments have tremendously augmented the efforts of the national government. We oh, know there's a right. lot of security initiatives that are being done on the ground All right. to ensure that the Kenyan people also participate in ensuring that the counties are Mi safe Mr. and secure. Mr. Werunga, thank you so much. We appreciate the insight. Thanks to retired Captain Simeo Werunga who joined us on the phone from Nairobi. Welcome back. Wrapping up this week's post-Brexit global market and Africa business news is Africa 54's business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting from the Nasdaq headquarters in New York. From the Nasdaq market site in Times Square, I'm Jill Malandrino. Most of the post-Brexit equity sell-off has now been erased to close out the month of June and the first half of 2016. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is coming off of three consecutive days of 200 plus point gains. For the month, the Dow rose 0.8%, the S&P gained 0.1%, and the Nasdaq's behind losing 2.1%. Markets were once again boosted by central bank easing talk. African markets recovered as well as indicated by the Vanek Vectors Africa ETF, ticker symbol AFK. This is an exchange-traded fund that tracks the performance of the GDP Africa Index, which is up four and a quarter percent since the Brexit vote. Let's take a look at what's making headlines on the continent. Nigeria's Niger State plans to seek bondholders' approval next month to restructure its 21 billion naira, or 74 million U.S. worth of debt, its advisor said on Thursday, as it seeks ways to ease strains caused by a plunge in crucial oil revenue. On July 28th, Niger will meet with bondholders to approve an extension to its five-year debt due in 2018 to 2023 and an increase from the coupon 14% to 16%. Nigeria's stock market is becoming the most interesting one on the African continent to foreign investors after the country devalued its currency, said Mark Mobius of Templeton Emerging Markets Group. Templeton has around $700 million U.S. in assets under management in its dedicated Africa fund, which has its biggest holdings in Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa. 
It was just announced this morning that Nigeria has signed oil and gas infrastructure agreements worth $80 billion U.S. with Chinese companies, the state oil company said. Kenyan growth picked up in the first quarter of 2016, helped by improved performance across the economy and especially tourism, the statistics office said on Thursday. The economy is estimated to have maintained the growth momentum that started during the second quarter of 2015, the bureau said. The most notable improvement was a rebound in activities of accommodation and food services. From the NASDAQ market site in New York City, I'm Jill Malandrino for Africa 54. Military operations have chased Boko Haram out of towns and cities across Nigeria's northeast since early last year. But it is only recently that people have begun returning to their homes in Adamawa State, near the border with Cameroon. Chris Stein traveled to the area and has this report. The last service held at the EYN Church in Michika ended in gunfire. Boko Haram insurgents stormed the town during Sunday worship nearly two years ago, in September 2014. EYN's worshippers now gather amid the ruins. The congregation has lost several hundred members. There are mix of uh, reasons. Some, uh, their houses have been burned down. Some, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons. They don't have shelters. Some are still afraid of coming back. Towns across Adamawa State are slowly coming back to life, but it's not the same life as before Boko Haram. Residents live with the scars of the insurgents' brief occupation. Boko Haram sacked this school. It's since been mostly rebuilt. In the villages outside Michika, devastation remains. Outside Michika, they have burned all the necessary places that we use them. Uh, houses, schools, and they have killed many peoples. Local vigilantes fought alongside the military to push Boko Haram out of towns in Adamawa State, but it came at a cost. A vigilante in Gombe, Husseini Bunja, was shot through the arm during combat. He can't work because of the injury. I only get assistance in the market and among friends who know I have the problem or when I beg outside my house. People often assist. Some give 500 naira, some 200, some 100. One charity is also helping me. When Boko Haram descended on Gombe, Habiba Nasiru hid in this room. She eventually fled the town with her siblings while her father stayed to fight the insurgents. Fear of Boko Haram lingers. There are things you could do comfortably before that you can't do now. Because before you didn't think of it. It was far away from you. Now you can see it with your eyes and hear it with your ears and you begin to imagine that what happened is still happening and you become jittery. The region still lives under threat. Two days after VOA visited Michika, Boko Haram opened fire on a funeral in a village north of the town, killing 18 people. Chris Stein for VOA News, Michika, Nigeria. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, how Morocco is coping with a drop in tourism during Ramadan. Stay with us. Science and technology, here's what's new. Technology startups are taking root and creating a buzz in Yaba, Nigeria. This suburb of Lagos is now a tech hub with the potential to attract international venture capitalists and more established digital firms. Online retailer Jumia, a would-be Amazon for Africa, has set up shop here and is betting that it can get consumers out of the street markets and onto its website. Nicholas Martin is the chief executive at Jumia. Something that is maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, compete with the Silicon Valley, but being perceived and recognized as the equivalent, of the African equivalent of the, of, of the Silicon Valley. It's going to take time, it's going to take support, it's going to take a lot of infrastructure work. There is still a lot to be done. But Martin says Nigeria has the potential to be a major world player in the tech industry. The fundamental potential is here. The market is here. The appetite is here. For VOA's What's New, I'm Todd Grosson.
I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're gonna get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. In North Africa, Morocco relies heavily on tourism to support the national economy. This year was the case for the past couple of years. The high tourism season has fallen in the middle of the holy Muslim month of Ramadan, leading to unusually slow business in the country. Samia Erazuki reports on how the locals are coping with the losses. With Morocco's diverse geographic landscape, spanning from desert dunes to snow-capped mountains, as well as scenic beaches, it is no wonder the country has always attracted tourists. Paired with its proximity to Europe and borders with African countries, Morocco has developed a growing tourism industry that counts as one of the country's major sectors. Every year, especially during the summer, millions of tourists pour into the country, with last year's figures adding up to over 10 million tourists. This year, however, the holy Muslim month of Ramadan, which follows the lunar calendar, has disrupted the tourism industry's flow. During the day, most restaurants and cafes remain closed in observation of the daily fast. Some, however, choose to remain open, catering to the demand of the low number of tourists, as well as foreigners living in Morocco. <laughs> In general, when Ramadan falls in the summer, like this past few years, there are the people that go to pray during the night, so business is slow during the evenings. Business is not as busy as it usually is during the rest of the year. Things are slow during Ramadan. Hotels in Morocco have also experienced a major drop in business as Ramadan has fallen in late June, early July this year. This has forced hotel management to turn to other ways in order to generate income. We have a decrease in the activity. It depends, let's say, just take an example of a month, we can go from 75% occupancy to 50 or 55. So we take you more than 20 or 25 uh, rate occupancy at every hotel. But beside, we have uh, people in Morocco, you know, people from Rabat come, we can to come out for tour and we can we have some people coming out so for the food and beverage income it's quite okay for this month recently the ministry of tourism held a conference presenting the latest figures in the tourism industry including the latest resorts shopping centers and other tourist attractions despite these developments the impact of ramadan on the industry clouded the event Ramadan, there is also always like low activity in terms of tourism. So uh, we, most of the hotels, I mean, that's when they do their renovation. That's when they do a lot of investment. They do training. There are people who take vacation also in Ramadan because it's just before the summer. So uh, this is a low season for us, very low. Uh, there is not much activity, but there is some in some places. Tour operators continue to work because the tour operators, they, they, they work according to all all Inclusive, but a lot of Moroccans don't travel, a lot of foreigners also don't come during Ramadan. But we are expecting also a very high season after the summer, so people are just gearing up in order to come in the summer. Morocco's tourism industry has more to contend with aside from just the month of Ramadan. With almost bi-weekly announcements of the dismantling of terror cells in the country, security concerns, among other factors, have led to a steady decline of visitors from certain countries like France and Spain. There is, however, a silver lining as visitors from Germany, the UK, and even Brazil have picked up over the past three years, with as much as a 19% increase in visits. Despite uncertainty surrounding the security situation, Morocco aims to remain one of the region's premier tourism destinations. Sami Erzuki for VOA, Rabat, Morocco. It's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a countdown of Africa 54's top five music videos. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Filled with beautiful music, thanks to an impromptu a cappella performance from a visitor. 34 year old Star Swain from Tallahassee, Florida, turned heads with her rendition of the Star Spangled Banner while visiting Washington, D.C. The crowd broke into cheers and applause as Swain hit the final note. Then strangers approached her with compliments, hugs and high fives. The incredible video has since earned more than 13 million views on Facebook, just in time for the 4th of July. In other viral video news, a police officer proposed to his boyfriend while on duty at London Gay Pride. The story went viral after the Metropolitan Police LGBT network tweeted a picture of PC Phil's proposal. He was marching along the parade route when his commander halted the procession, the procession and PC Phil hunted out his boyfriend in the crowd and got down on one knee, much to the crowd's delight. Phil was given the green light, but after a hug and a kiss, it was back to work for the newly engaged cop. And finally, Scarlett Johansson has taken the crown as Hollywood's highest grossing actress ever. The website box office module that tracks how much money movie, movies make says Johansson's films have made more than $3.3 billion. Cameron Diaz is the second highest grossing actress at just over $3 billion. Johansson's status on the list is no doubt helped has helped her by recurring role as Black Widow in the Avengers series and other Marvel blockbusters, including this year's Captain America Civil War. And that's what's trending today. Welcome back. It's Music Makers Friday. And today we have Africa 54's top five African music videos. And now here's Countdown with hosts Sanusi Diallo and Leila Diallo. Welcome to VOA's African Hit. I'm Sanusi Diallo. And I am Layla Diallo. Hold on, you Layla Diallo? Yes. Diallo, sure. Mm -hmm. So, possibility you might be my long cousin, maybe. Cousin. We have to check on that. We'll check that out. <laughs> Today, we are presenting the top five music videos from Africa by African artists. Our number five is the warmth in this cold world, a melody maker. A music genius from Ivory Coast. He's a search venom with this new release. Mère de ma life. Je me rappelle à Yoru en cité d'ici. C'est la base de Gandier. Avec tout ma part à mon bras d'enfance, chacun avait ses ambitions. Chacun avait ses ambitions. combines pop and traditional African style. Straight from Cameroon, here's Renis with La Sauce. du Mali. Thank you. 
commence pas à sentir la pression monter. On a mieux ce qu'il faut. Il va one et Mr. Black. Straight from Angola, he has combined his Angolan musical roots with French and American sound. He's on numéro 2 of the week. See for Pedro, tu es sa Best known for his 2008 MTN project Fame West Africa, as well as his song Kikere, Voici Iana in Heartbeat. Oh yeah, I'll be your number one boy, Abby. I like a studio, show me love, Abby. You say make a sing song, Abby. And every time you come around, I like a show you show me love. So me stand there and sing a song, Abby. Oh no, Abby. Oh no, Abby. Oh yeah, wait. Part one. I started feeling your body, your baby, what one? Ah, uh-huh. want to. I give it to you every day. I'm on my call too. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Shawty wanna go down for me. Shawty wanna slow wine, no wine. They say she no one come for the money. They say she wanna be mine. Baby, give me something. I want to feel it. Oh, baby, give me Ziggy Ziggy. You blow my mind. I swear you didn't blow my mind. Oh, my. Me and I feel let you go. My light's a lie. And that's all for today. Make sure you check our social media pages at VOA's African Hate. The African Musical Countdown. It's on VOA's African Hate. Once again, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for watching and good night from Washington. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here's a word you might have heard about the Ebola virus. Serum. The experimental Ebola serum that was used on American and Spanish missionaries is produced at a small firm in California. The manufacturer says it's run out of the serum, but it's trying to increase production as quickly as possible. Serum is a fluid taken from blood. It can be processed to make a vaccine. A serum contains proteins called antibodies that help the body fight disease. In our story, medical experts gave a new serum to Ebola victims in the hope of curing them. So the next time you hear the word serum, you will know what this news word means.